All right, my friends, we are live. So, you know, I think if you're going to be investing for a long period of time, it's helpful, actually probably even essential to have to come up with some sort of investment strategy or some sort of investment philosophy. I think it's a really important thing to do. And in tonight's live stream, I'm going to walk you through what my philosophy, I guess, or my strategy is so far. I've only been investing for a few years, as you guys know, and this is one of those things that will that will evolve and you'll develop over time. But I wanna share with you what I've gotten down with, gotten down for mine so far. We're gonna get into it. But before we do, welcome to another Dividend Happy Hour. I'm so stoked to be back with you guys for another week. And you know we gotta kick it off with a quick cheers. So here's to the yield, here's to the growth, and here's to that sweet, sweet cash flow. And also here's to you guys. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, and I'm still coming up. I still gotta think of a better Cheers. I think this one's a little bit worn out, so I got to come up with a better a better toast for these weekly dividend happy hours. But um, anyway, guys, let me know a few things here in the live chat or in the comments below if you're watching the replay. Number one, what stocks did you buy this week? Let me know what you added to your portfolio. Number two, what are you sipping on for the dividend happy hour tonight? Um, what did you bring to drink? And then also number three, anything cool happen in your guys' portfolio? Any milestones? Any you know? Any any income milestones? Any portfolio value milestones? Maybe you finally hit that six figure mark in the portfolio, or or maybe you finally hit uh, one thousand dollars in annual dividend income, or something like that. Anything like that? Share it here in the live chat. I want to uh, want to put that up on the screen and blast it out to the world. But uh, otherwise, let's go through here real quick. I want to um, I want to say what's up to all you guys, and real quick, just. To let you guys know what I'm sipping on, just some water, just you know, super simple tonight. A little H2O, but uh, let's see who we got here in the live chat. I see Chris is here. We got Lucas. We got Pat. Doctor Nubenstein, <laughs> nice. Um, Josh is here. We got Luis. Be still. Charles. Boone. Kyle. Uh, Kevin's here. We got Zach Attack. Who did you, I think you just changed your name, man? Since you went all crypto, you're now you're not Mister Zach Attack anymore. You're Crypto Tatted Zach. You a uh, little little identity change on us, but uh, Suzuki man's here. We got Shamir. Shamir, what's going on? You're you're slacking a little bit, man. You're letting Chris. You're letting Chris here get first in the chat. That is, that is unacceptable, my friend. Unacceptable. But uh, <laughs> let's keep going. I see Eli. I see Adon. My man Zal is here. Good to see ya. Uh, Michael's here. We got Burn Survivor. Survivor Josh, who is drinking a cold beer and Blackstone Cherry Cigar. Wow, very nice. I love that, man. Um, man, I've only had a couple cigars in my life, but uh, that's cool. Really cool. Uh, Dominique's here. What's going on, Dominique? We got Tommy here who picked up some ADC and tried for realty income, but it played the T's, getting one penny uh, from the limit order before it just didn't go through, I suppose. Um, let's see here. Who else we got? I see Jim in the building. Um, Burn Survivor is all jacked up on Mountain Dew. Nice. I guess there's worse things you could be jacked up on. Uh, let's see, Zal drinking some water, picked up some realty income, 299, or excuse me, 291 shares of realty income. That's crazy. What, how many, so what's that per month? Let's go, I want to go look at this real quick. Um, sorry guys, you're not supposed to see that quite yet. Uh, let's go, oh, what are they paying per share per year? So per share per year, $3.07 times 291. So that's, that's almost 900 bucks per year from realty income. I have that math right, right? 246, two, yeah, 1827. So maybe about 275 per year from realty income, which break that down per month. That's over 20 bucks a month. Okay, nice. I think, maybe my, I think my math's, I think my math's right there. I hope so. Um, you know, this is gonna bother me. 291, gosh dang it. Gosh dang it, 291 times 3.07. Yeah, okay, oh, if, you know, 893, okay, I wasn't too far off divided by 12, so, oh, my math was way off. That's like $75 a month from realty income, okay. Yeah, okay, crazy, I don't know what I was thinking. Okay, moving on, um, let's see here. Let's see, uh, let's see, Luis is back after a nice long vacation, good to see you, man. Hope you had a good trip. Where did you go? Also, let me know in the live chat where you went on vacation. Um, Karma's in the house. There he is. We can start the stream, guys. Karma's Karma's in the building. Um, let's see. We got TCAF drinking some water. Have a nice little shopping spree, it looks like. Okay, very, very nice. Uh, Eli also had a nice little shopping spree. Looks like a couple ETFs there with some Discover 
and Altria Group. Good time to pick up some big. Uh, good time to pick up some MO if you're going to. And it looks like it's going to be one of those tongue twisting nights for me, my friends. Goodness gracious. Okay, Nico also had a nice little shop and spree. Some Pfizer, some Pepsi, and a little bit of Diet Pepsi is what he's sipping on. Good stuff. So Kyle's, we got Kyle sipping some root beer. We got Anthony drinking some Diet Pepsi. Nice little shopping spree there. I'm seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of realty income pickups so far. Let's see. Definitely some SEHDs, but that, you know, that's to be expected for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, Steven or Stefan sold out of Walgreens and put the money into, I don't know what, what's BN? BN and BAM. Is, is that Blackstone? I'm not 100% on that, but I think that could be Blackstone. Um, looks like uh, Walgreens dropped. Was that today? Today they announced that they were the, you know, they're getting a new CEO or the, the current CEO is resigning or whatever. Looks like they had a, a little drop from what I saw earlier today. Uh, yeah, so their CEO, Roz, is what they call her, Roz Brewer resigns. Okay. Looks like there's a lot of, lot of thoughts on that one. So it could be a good move. I mean, Walgreens has definitely not, like, definitely not been performing that well over the last, I mean, five years. Jeez, they are down 65%. Okay, so about a 7.5% drop today. That's definitely pretty substantial. Okay. Um, anyone buying Walgreens on that note? Anyone, anyone thinks this is a good buying opportunity? I'm curious. Um, let's see who else we got here. Let's keep going. Yeah, a lot of realty income pickups I'm seeing. Um, Boone, very interesting combination. Coffee and Kool Aid. Wow, I might have to try that one tomorrow morning. Um, very interesting combo. Let's see, Kyle. Yep, also some realty income and SCHD. Okay, cool milestone too. Hit five hundred dollars in dividends in, in annual dividend income. That's fantastic. Good job, man. That's great. Really cool milestone. Paolo says, Ryan, you rock. Thanks, Paolo. You rock as well. I appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Shamir also taking advantage of a little Texas Roadhouse before it goes ex-dividend. Good stuff. Um, let's see here. Keep going. Ooh, Kyle, just shy of $15,000 in the portfolio. Nice little milestone there. Um, let's see here. Jim with some nice purchases. Main Street Capital Corporation, New York Community Bank, and Merck were the big purchases. Sipping on some branch chain amino acids. Love it, Jim. Jim, you just just uh, finished pumping some iron or what's what's with the BCAAs? Nice. I uh, got to say what's up to my man Dave. Good to see you, Dave. Hope you're having a good day and a good week. Crazy weather we're having. So Dave's also a Vegas local. Crazy, crazy weather in Vegas today, guys, it's uh, there's flash floods today, or there, I don't know, it's been like storming on and off, thunder and lightning pretty much all day. And I kid you not, and I'm not even exaggerating, this is, today is probably the heaviest rain that I can ever remember seeing. It was, it was crazy in my neck of the woods here in Vegas. Just, it was like the opening sequence from the day after tomorrow. It was, it was crazy, crazy rain. Um, anyway, let's keep going here. Ooh, let's see. Todd stacking up on some oh, oh, oh. Good stuff. Uh, we got Anthony here for the first time in the live stream. Anthony, thanks for tuning in. Hope you uh, hope you enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, these these dividend happy hours, you never know. You never know what's going to happen when we go live. It's uh, it's always a party. Um, let's see here. We got Trindaware greetings from Germany. That's so awesome. It blows my mind, like, and we'll get into the main event in just a moment, guys, I promise. But it, it just blows my mind how many... Gosh, guys, it just blows my mind how many, uh, how far and wide this dividend investing community is, and these these live streams definitely remind me of that. And it's cool. And just another example, we got Christopher watching all the way from Puerto Rico. What a what a world we live in, guys. It's crazy. Love it. It's so cool that we're all able to uh, all able to come together though through this and uh, be able to hang out. So I'm thankful for you guys tuning in all across the world. So yeah, Zal says your math is off again two weeks in a row. I know. I know, man. Thank goodness for calculators, though. <laughs> um, let's keep going here. Wow. Trindaware picked up f almost 50 shares of Main Street Capital Corporation yesterday. Wow. Good stuff. Um, Uh-oh. Dr. Nubenstein, you've got some exp explaining to do. I feel dirty. I bought some in a dividend trap. What did, you, uh, what did you buy? Maybe I passed it. But let me know again in the live chat what you bought because I think I missed it if you, if you said it. Um, Let's see. 
Maybe he'll say it if we keep scrolling down. Um, where is it here? Uh, I don't see it. Okay. It's raining in my lightning in my lighting shop at the Mirage. Dang, man. It's, it's so it's like leaking into the into the building. Is that what you mean right now? Wow. Um man, I'm looking to see what Dr. Nubenstein picked up. I don't see it. Oh man, we got all the way from Korea, watching all the way from Korea. That's pretty incredible. Okay, we got another one watching from Puerto Rico. Bought some Walgreens today. The price was too good. And dang, Dave, stay dry out there, man. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that it's leaking in, in where you're working right now. That's It's just crazy. Um, okay, so guys, oh, we got Paolo also. Greetings from Portugal. That's, gosh, guys, it's so, it's, it just blows my mind. Um, okay, so for those of you who are just now tuning in, I mean, I know you saw the title of the video, but, um, you know, I'm a, we're, we're about to get into it too. So I'm going to share with you my investing strategy, my, my investing, I'm going to use strategy and philosophy interchangeably throughout the stream, but um, I'm kind of referring to it as, as one and the same thing. Either way, you know, I think every investor should have some sort of guiding principle, some sort of North Star that they're following to help them you know, help them uh, to just to help have some sort of direction in this investing journey because there's so many different stocks you can invest in. There's so many strategies you can implement, and obviously, you know, you can kind of you can kind of do a little bit of everything if you really wanted to. But either way, I think it helps to have some sort of guiding principles that you follow if you're going to be investing for a long period of time. And there's a few reasons why, and I'll I'll pull them up on the screen here. So here's why it might be important to have some sort of investing strategy, some sort of investment philosophy laid out. Um, and I, I actually have mine written down. That's where a lot of these notes that we're going to look at come from. I have not written down somewhere um, that I can refer to and expand on over time. But why it's important, the first point there is clarity of purpose. So I kind of kind of touched on, on our, touched on it already. Having an investment philosophy, it's going to help provide some sort of roadmap for your investing journey. It's going to give you a clarity as to to where you're going and why you're doing it, and it forces you to define your investment goals and your objectives, you know, what you're trying to get out of this portfolio, which will help you guide um, or will help guide your investment decisions. So you can take this roadmap and it'll kind of tell you where you should be looking in terms of and what you should be looking for in terms of the stocks that you're investing in. Now, the second point there and the second reason why it might be important, it kind of ties back to the first. All of these kind of tie back to the first one, um, but it's risk management. Knowing your investment strategy, your philosophy can help you make decisions that are you know, in line with your risk tolerance. And that's going to be determined in some part by your goals and objectives. Based on your goals and objectives, that can kind of kind of you know, kind of help you get a sense and also timeline and 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 that sort of thing, and also just preference, which you'll figure that out as you go, I suppose. But that will kind of help you get a feel for how much risk you want to take on as as an investor. But this third point here, consistency and discipline. Having some sort of strategy, having some sort of philosophy, some sort of roadmap to follow will help you stay consistent and will help you stay disciplined on this this long and, and tedious investing journey. Not only that, but it encourage you, encourages you to, if you know where you're going, it's going to help you stay consistent in that. Um, and when you have a clear strategy, you're less likely to make I guess, emotional decisions that can negatively impact your portfolio. If you have a more thought out, well thought out approach, you won't, um, you won't do things based on emotion or, or knee jerk reactions, which is uh, an easy thing to do as an investor, especially depending on the st stocks you're investing in that can be pretty volatile. It can get pretty dicey out there. And um, sometimes it can really test your test your will as an investor. So having having some sort of, of guidelines to follow can really help you stay disciplined in your approach. But the last thing here, which is maybe one that that's not as as much thought of is legacy planning. Having some sort of guiding principles, you know, cuz a lot of us guys, let me let me switch back over here. A lot of us build our portfolios today with the intent that these portfolios will live long after we do. So, having some sort of guidelines in place can can serve as exactly that, guidelines and a roadmap for those who take over our portfolios after we're gone. Um, it can help ensure that the wealth that you build today in this lifetime is preserved when it's passed down to the future generations. And that's probably something that's, I don't know, maybe not, maybe not as much as, as not as 
not thought of as much as, as some of the first points that we talked about. So those are a few reasons why I think it's important to establish something like this. And I'm going to take a sip of water real quick, and then I'll, I'll get into what a little bit of what my strategy and what my philosophy is at this point. And also, just as a reminder to you guys, I know I said it already, but I've only been investing for a few years. You know, I, <laughs> and you guys have heard me say this numerous times. Like I started doing this with absolutely no experience, no financial background whatsoever. So a lot of what I'm about to share with you, my my philosophy so far has kind of been pieced together just from what I've learned so far on this investing journey. And with it being a, a lifelong game, an infinite game, something that will never end, um, this philosophy, this strategy that I'm going to be talking about today will likely evolve and it will likely change over time. Um, so keep that in mind as we're going through it. This is just kind of where I'm at so far, I guess, on the journey. And down the road, you know, Part of, the, part of the fun of making these videos is is they stay online forever. Maybe that's good or bad. I don't know. <laughs> it depends on the video. But it'll be fun to look back on this a few years from now and see how things have changed and also how things have stayed the same. But without further ado, here's kind of an overview of my investment philosophy at this point so far. So at the core of my philosophy, I'm just going to read it for you, are the combined principles of value investing and dividend investing. And, not, and while my investing philosophy will undoubtedly change and evolve with time as I gain more experience, these two, these two core principles will remain constant throughout. So I figure as long as I live, like I don't, you know, value investing, which I'll talk more about this, both of them in a moment, but value investing, buying stocks when they're at an attractive valuation is something that's always going to be a part of my, my strategy. My philosophy is an important thing to do. Dividend investing as well. Um, dividend investing, and I say dividend invest, when I say dividend investing, I, I just essentially mean investing solely in dividend stocks. Um, maybe not solely. There might be a point down the road, I don't know, where I buy a stock that doesn't pay a dividend, but investing um, primarily for cash flow down the road and dividend growth is something that that will likely remain a part of my strategy for forever. I don't see myself ever, ever changing. I love doing this. This fits me, my personality, and my temperament just like a glove. So I don't see either of these aspects ever changing. But diving a little bit more into the value investing side of things, here's a quote from Charlie Munger about value investing that's always resonated with me. I've, I've read this a few times in a few different places. Um, and every time I see it, it's something that that really just sticks with me. It goes, all value investing, or all intelligent investing, excuse me, is value investing, acquiring more than you are paying for. You must value the business in order to value the stock. And I think that's what we're all trying to do as investors, right? No matter whether you are just buying a stock to see, you know, 100x returns, um, you're investing for share price appreciation, or you're investing for dividend growth or even dividend income, whatever. What you really want to do, everyone wants to buy as low as they can and sell as high as they can, if is sell at all in our point, or in our case, you know, a lot of us are buying with the intent to never sell our stocks. But if someday you do want to sell them, it's it it makes sense and it, it's a smart move to buy them at as attractive an a value at it's <laughs> here we go. It makes sense to buy them at as attractive a valuation as you can because it just applies an even greater margin of safety. And kind of expand on that here. Once again, guys, this is going to be a little bit of a <laughs> tongue-tied live stream. Um, so when researching an investment for my portfolio, I conduct thorough analysis to understand the underlying business. And I'll go into all these points here, too, as we continue going throughout this. But uh, financial and fundamental strengths and weaknesses, and also the intrinsic value. The last point there, the last note, the intrinsic value is, is the most closely tied to the value investing side of things. By pursuing value, attractive valuations, plus quality, which is the first few points, do I understand the business? Are they financially and fundamentally strong? Um, but anyway, through those things, my goal is to reduce the risk of capital losses, while enhancing the potential for long-term total returns. And just as a sidebar to a lot of this, guys, you know, um, there, may be some, there may be some stocks, there are certainly some stocks in my portfolio right now that I bought when I first started investing, when I, I wasn't really thinking about any of this stuff that I still hold today, that possibly go against some of, some of this philosophy. Um, and so when I'm talking about this strategy or this philosophy that I'm that I'm keeping in mind that I'm trying to implement as I approach the investments here. Um, consider it from like a this point 
forward sort of basis. So there's some stocks in my portfolio, like perhaps, I mean, we could make an argument for a few of them. We don't have to get into them that, um, that maybe don't align with some of this stuff. So, but moving forward, this, this approach that I'm outlining today is, is what I'm trying to follow. So anyway, continuing on to the dividend investing side of things, here's another quote specifically how, you know, about dividend investing from Kevin O'Leary that, that has really jumped out to me. It goes, here's how I think about money. As soldiers, I think about money as soldiers. I send them out to war every day. I want them to take prisoners and come home so there's more of them. And that's exactly how I think about dividend investing. I want my money to go out and make more money and then do that again and again and again and again for the rest of eternity. And the cool thing about dividend investing is when that happens, when you put those soldiers out and they come home with even more, more soldiers and they'll, they all go out the next day, that it's just, you guys know how it is. It's a compounding effect. That's the dividend snowball. Or as my friend Professor G likes to say, the dividend avalanche in effect right there. And so that's that in addition to value investing is what I want to implement um, and build in my portfolio. Is that snowball? Is that dividend avalanche? Um, it's war, baby. It's war. But anyway, expanding on this a little bit more, my ultimate goal is to use the dividends paid by my investments to someday, I should have put someday in here, to someday support my financial needs. At some point, I'd love to use the dividends to, at least in part, if not fully pay, you know, pay my pay for my lifestyle, um, which is why I exclusively invest in dividend paying stocks. Dividends not only provide investors, this is kind of a little second point here, dividends not only provide investors with a steady stream of passive income, but they're also indicative of a company's financial strength and stability. This is another reason why I like to invest in dividend stocks, because only a financially strong company can maintain a consistent dividend and grow it over time. So, you know, that's that's another reason why dividends are important to me. Um, and I know dividends are not for everyone. I know I know there's a lot of people like to argue about dividends, but this is this is why I do why I do it. This works for me so far. Um, and so these two com these two things, value investing and dividend investing, are really at the backbone of my overall philosophy. But diving a bit deeper and getting into some of the things that I look for when researching a stock, researching a potential investment, okay? Going over here, the first thing is an understandable business model. I make sure that I can comprehend the business um, the business and how it makes money. I don't want it to be too over my head. This is a mistake that I, I made in the past for sure, where I bought into something that probably was too complex and, and over my head, like I said. And it's just not a good thing. You know, it can... Um, it can really make things more difficult and make it harder to make informed decisions and stay confident during market volatility when you don't really understand the business. So moving forward, I need to make sure I understand the thing. What is it doing? And uh, you know, I, I need to understand why I'm investing in it. Okay. The second thing here, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit, but strong and growing financials. I'm looking for companies with a track record of consistent revenue and consistent earnings growth at a very basic level there. A company's ability to do so, to increase its earnings over time, should result in positive returns. And that just goes back to a quote I'm sure many of you guys have heard before, share price follows earnings. Um, and that's over a long period of time. Typically, if, if a company's earnings grows, uh, the share price should follow that. Now, not to mention growth, financial growth, you know, growth in earnings, growth in free cash flow. Um, it's the only way that a company can offer consistent dividend increases year after year. So that's definitely important. And as of late, guys, for me, and, you know, this will possibly change over time, but for me, one thing that's really been appealing to me when I'm when I'm looking at, at new stocks and I'm looking at new companies, something that really gets me excited is seeing a company with low debt um, or even potentially negative debt on a net basis. And... One of one recent company that I bought that's a great example of that is William Sonoma. No debt on the balance sheet, and there's something about that. And you can obviously companies can use leverage or use debt in a responsible way. It can actually help them grow. Um, but there's just something about seeing a company with with no debt on the balance sheet that gives you a little extra security as an investor because a company you know can't go bankrupt if it doesn't have any debt. So it's just a, an extra level of stability, an extra level of security there uh, for you as an investor. But going back to this, guys, the next thing that I'm looking for, um, obviously, are consistent or growing dividends. Now, I see companies with a history of either, like pretty much and or, making consistent payments and or growing the dividend payments. And I'll expand on this a little bit. So this consistency, though, is only achievable through sustained financial stability and solid management decisions. Now, when it comes to, 
you know, consistent and or growing dividends. I know that's kind of a weird way to word it, but you know, I don't really, there's different types of dividend stocks, right? There's, we, and we can categorize them a few different ways. I think in, in last week's stream, we put it on a spectrum, right? Usually these stocks can fall, these dividend stocks can fall somewhere on a spectrum between high yield and high dividend growth. So high dividend yield, high dividend growth. Typically these high dividend yielding stocks, and we can come up with a few examples of them, it's pretty common to see them not come with a lot of dividend growth, if any. You know, we can look at some companies, their their dividend growth caggers are maybe one or two percent if they've got yields in the five, six, seven, eight percent range. Um, but then there's some who just don't really grow their dividend at all, just make their payments are flat, and all you're getting is that high yield. Now, on the other end of that spectrum, there's the dividend growth stocks where the starting yield is not as high. Maybe we're talking zero to two percent, so or maybe even three percent, but then their dividend growth caggers are considerably you know, attractive. We're in some cases, double digits. We can look at Lowe's, Snap-on, William Sonoma is another example of that. And in my portfolio, I have a balance of, of a little bit of everything. I've got the high yielders that don't have a lot of growth, if any, that just make those consistently high dividend payments. And then on the other hand, you know, I've got the high growth dividend stocks who are growing their dividends at an aggressive rate every single year. And then I've got some that are in between. You know, I got some that don't have the highest yields, but also don't have the highest dividend growth rates. The stalwart type companies like the Procter & Gamble's, uh, Coca-Cola's, the Johnson & Johnson's, those sort of things. So in my portfolio, I, I have kind of the whole kit and caboodle. And because of that, you know, I don't really... I don't know that I really look for a certain type of yield or a type of growth rate specifically. Um, I like having a balance of everything, but I will say now at this point, me personally, I feel like that I have enough of the high yielders, ones on this side of the spectrum, and moving forward, I feel that if I'm going to add any more, I probably will lean towards dividend growth, but it's possible that in the future, I swing back to the other side of the spectrum. I'm just trying to maintain that balance, I suppose. Um, so that's why I say I look for companies with a history of consistent payments and or consistent growth. And obviously, if a company is growing consistently, they're they're making consistent payments. But at the very least, I want to see consistency in the payments. I don't want to see a dividend for a couple of years, then it have it be completely eliminated. Then they bring it back for a few quarters, and it's gone again. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's kind of what I mean there. But anyway, going back here, guys, the next thing I am look for is sensible management and capital allocation. I got to say, out of all of the qualities I look for, management, uh, analyzing management is probably one of my weaker points. I need to exper I need more experience in this area, if I'm being honest. I need more experience here to better gauge the competence and direction of a management team. This will come in time, I know, as I analyze more companies and, and just have more experience as an investor. Um, but anyway, a company's responsible approach to capital allocation, going to that next point, um, including dividend increases, like we kind of talked about, and share buy buybacks when appropriate, with a huge like underline on that point, when appropriate is a plus. And I've mentioned Williams-Sonoma a few times, but they're, they're, they are an example of someone who, try or a company that tries to make uh, do share buybacks when it's appropriate. In their last earnings call, I listened to it the other day, um, one of the things they kept mentioning in, in, as it pertains to share buybacks or you know returning shareholder value is opportunistic share buybacks or share repurchases, which is basically buying back shares when the price is right, when it's appropriate, and not not kind not uh, not buying shares back when they're too expensive, when maybe there's a better use of capital. So that is something that I like to see. That's verbiage I like to see them see them using opportunistic share buybacks. So. Um, that's just an example of that. Uh, but anyway, the last thing here is a competitive advantage. I like to see that. Not all company has a competitive advantage. I'm sure there's some that don't. But um, anyway, this could be things like you know a strong brand, uh, high barriers to entry, maybe like a very loyal customer base. We can come up with some companies that have that, um, or even you know insensitivity to cyclical economic trends. If we look at something like a Procter and Gamble, they're pretty steady. They don't seem to swing a lot. But um, anyway, a competitive advantage can set a company apart from its peers and position it for long-term growth. So that's definitely something that I like to look for. And and kind of with that said, I want to ask you guys a question there in the live chat or in the comments below. When when it comes to a competitive advantage. When you hear the term competitive advantage, what is like, what's the first company that you think of? What is the first company that comes to mind? I'm curious to know what you guys have to say about that. Let me know in the live chat uh, or in the comments below if you're watching the replay. Competitive, competitive advantage, what's the first company that comes to mind?
Let's see. I'm interested to see what you guys say. <sighs> yep, I see a few good ones here. Okay. I see MasterCard and Visa. Those are good ones. A uh, couple of toll booth companies is what they call them. Um, Rex says Apple. That's definitely one that comes to mind. Yep, Shawdog, Apple as well. Uh, Jim says Union Pacific. That is definitely one. I actually didn't think of that, but that is a good one. Uh, we got Apple again. Apple, uh, a lot of Apple. ASML, that's the, uh, oh gosh, lithography company, right? Definitely a competitive advantage. Um, high, very high barrier to entry. That's their competitive advantage there. Um, Gary says Microsoft for sure. Costco, that's a good one. Zal says Visa for sure. Suzuki Man, another Apple. Uh, MC, MasterCard, I'm guessing. Um, Tesla, okay, I could see that for sure. Um, they definitely have like a, kind of like Apple, they definitely have, and Starbucks actually, that was one that came to mind for me. I see a Don, excuse me, said Starbucks down there. Um, definitely like a cult-like customer base, so, or, and even like a cult-like investor, investor base, uh, potentially. Let's see here. Simple Hillbilly Lowe's and Home Depot. Yes, those are a couple other ones that came to mind for me as well. They operate in, uh, I mean, they they have some com competitors, but like those are the big two. It's, it's more or less a duopoly with those guys. Uh, Bert says THD. I actually don't know that company. I need to, let me see here. THD. No, that's an ETF. What are we talking about here, Bert? Um, yep, Adon, like I said, uh, Starbucks. Gendry is saying, I think this is in response to the competitive advantage, Walgreens, MPW, and Dollar General. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Julius says KLAC. What's that one? Let me see here. Let's see. I don't know that I honestly don't know that I'm familiar with this company. Huh. Okay, so something in semiconductors. I'll have to explore that a little bit more. Okay. Um, Chris says Walmart. Sure. Let's see. Vinit says, or Vinit, excuse me, says 3M. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with that. I think they definitely have one. Um, Alberto says MCO. What's MCO? You guys are throwing some good companies at me. Oh, Moody's. Yeah, they, they certainly have one for sure. Um, Jay says Altria. Yep. I could see that. Gendry, another one, uh, Home Depot. Zal's throwing a few more at us. Yep. Yeah, definitely. All good choices, guys. I see Amazon, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, Realty Income. Um, let's see. <laughs> Julius says Rick, our, uh, RCI Hospitality Holdings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Bert says Home Depot. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'll show you what, I don't know if you saw it on the screen, <laughs> what THD was. So it's some um, some iShares Thailand ETF, which seems definitely interesting. What, like while we're here, what are some of these holdings? Uh, I, you know, I doubt that I've heard of any of these. Airports of Thailand. Hmm. Interesting. Airports. I've never thought of investing in an airport, but that could be, that could be interesting to look at. Um, Suzuki Man Watsko, yes, that is definitely a good one. I'm glad you said that one. Dex says Intercontinental Exchange, yep, that's another toll booth company right there. Um, let's see, let's keep going. Yeah, uh, ASML once again, no competition for sure. ADP, uh, yeah, they do have a competitive advantage. They have some competitors, but yeah, they're they're a good company for sure. Um, yeah, okay. MasterCard, BlackRock. Okay, Intuit. Yeah, Intuit does have a competitive advantage for sure. Intuit was a good looking company. I ended up passing on that one, but... Let's see, yeah. You guys, great, uh, great companies. And real quick, we've got to shout out T. Johnson, who finally made a live stream. Good to see you. Um, okay, but anyway, guys, let's go back to it. So... Those are those are the, the the handful of things that I look for. There's five things there, um, you know, nothing too crazy. And, and you guys know, like, 
this is all stuff that you've heard before. I'm not reinventing the wheel with this strategy, with this approach. This is this is very tried and true stuff. Um, and like I said, I'm not reinventing the wheel. A lot of a lot of what I've shown here, and a lot of the strategy and philosophy I've pulled together so far, are just come from things that I've learned from the people that inspire me as an investor. And I want to give a shout out to some of those people right here. It's kind of a you know, it's a short list right now, but it really is. This list could be so much longer. And there's some there's some familiar names there for sure. Warren, Charlie, Ben Graham, Peter Lynch, Monish Pabrai, Guy Spear. Um, you know, and there's some other some other of those super investors that we could add to this list. I just didn't want to make it too long. But there's some other people as well who I've just, I've really learned so much from um, here in this community. I mean, my, I got to shout out my man, Russ Knopf. You know, I was before I even started my channel, I was watching him and I just I've been able to learn so much from just from watching him and also now just having him as a friend, just just and just talking to him. I've I've learned so much about investing. Um and we talk we talk a lot and I think we push each other to be better, more knowledgeable investors. So he's someone I, I certainly look up to and appreciate in this space. Kevin Burgess is another one. I love Kevin. And every time I watch one of Kevin's videos, um Every time I read something from him in the in the Discord group, I learn something. He is he is someone I look up to so much and and makes me want to be a better investor. He gets me excited about investing. PPC Ian, the OG Thug Life Dividend Investor. I can't say enough good things about PPC. He uh he he is probably one of the he's he's certainly a big reason why I'm a dividend investor. Um you know, yeah, I can't say enough good things about PPC Ian. Joseph Carlson's another one as well. I love watching his videos. I've learned so much from watching him. Um, and he's he, like the, the rest of them, is someone who really inspires me to be a better investor and think long, think more and, and do more with this stuff. Um, and then last but not least, I got to give a shout out to everyone in the Discord group. Kevin's in there, I know. Russ is in there, I know. Uh, Joseph Carlson, we don't have in there quite yet, nor PPC in, but you know, never say never. But um, I got to give a shout out to everyone in the Discord group because, I, you know, everyone in there is so, so always so willing to lend their sage advice and share their experience, and and you know, everyone in that group pushes each other to be better as well. It's not some sort of echo chamber where everyone's just going to agree with you. Everyone's going to tell you exactly what they think, and there's certainly value in that. So I got to shout out Zal. I got to shout out X Dividend Dad. I got to shout out Mr. Income. Got to shout out Suzuki Man. Got to shout out Jacob Morris. Got to shout out literally everyone else in the group. There's over 2,400 investors in there at this point, and um, it's just a great group of people, and I'm thankful to be able to have all those people. Shamir, I got to shout you out too. I know you're in there. And yeah, and I'm sorry if I, if I didn't say your name, but there's, there's so many great people in there. And, um, and also if you guys want to join the discord group, there's a link to it in the description of this video. But, uh, real quick, I want, you know, I want to put it back on you guys. That's pretty much my, my whole spiel. Um, but I want to put it back on you guys and ask, what would you include in your investing philosophy? And I, and I know it's kind of a loaded question, but you know, bullet points, maybe just one thing. What is one thing that you would include in your investing philosophy, or if you had to sum it up in a couple sentences, how would you? I'm curious to know. Let me know that in the live chat and also let me know in the comments below. And do like Zal says, all these things here, like button, hit the subscribe button, and also join the Discord group. Once again, there is a link to grab it in the description of the video. And it's free to join too. You just click the link, it'll take you right there. So, oh, and another important thing, I think a lot of people miss this. If you do join, upon joining, you will automatically be taken to the welcome page. Please read the rules on the welcome page because it will show you how to unlock all the rest of the channels, okay? When you go in there, initially it's gonna look like kind of a, a blank slate besides the welcome page, but uh, just read the rules. It'll tell you how to unlock all the channels to chat and all that stuff, so. Um, let's see here. Oh, and yeah, another thing. Sign up for the email newsletter. If you guys actually, I, I put out a, I don't know if a lot of you guys even know this, but I put out an email newsletter every single week um, I actually linked the most recent article, the most recent edition in the description of this video. If you guys want to read it, you can check it out. If you like it, there's a you know a little form to sign up to get it received directly to your sent directly to your inbox every week. But either way, you can read the most recent newsletter in the description of the video. So um, let's see here. So you guys' philosophy, as well put simply, I don't like volatile stocks. <laughs> Fair enough, ma'am. Uh, B still says investing is a marathon, not a sprint. That's certainly a a good addition to the philosophy. I agree. Uh, Jim says his philosophy very simple: don't run out of money before I die. Yeah, I get you, man. 
Uh, Fast Eddie says, if you die tomorrow, do you have some explaining to the people that inherited it? Inherited it, what to do with it? Ooh, that's a good, that's a good question. Maybe I need to add that to the bottom of like my investing philosophy sort of thing. Like just like a quick bullet point. Like if I die, step one, step two, step three, step four, whatever, <laughs> you know? So uh, Kyle says, cash is king, dividends are cash, stay humble, stay hungry. I like that. Cash is king, dividends are cash. So dividends are king. If A, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. See, I can't do math with numbers, but I can do it with letters. <laughs> um, let's see here. Yeah, some of you guys, I see some of you guys talking about the newsletter. Some of you guys get it. I appreciate you reading the newsletter too. There's a lot of you guys who do read it, who actually respond to it every week. And I really appreciate appreciate that. It's cool to, uh, it's cool to hear from you guys. It's, uh, it's, it's, I've been getting some crazy, uh, some crazy emails, like some that, that are really, uh, just really great to read. Let's see here. Let's keep going. Vineet says diversification between industry and sectors. Definitely. Um, oh, Matt says, this is cool. I wrote my sisters a note what to do with all my investments and what four positions to put it into. Yeah. Honestly, if I were to pass away, I'd probably would do something similar. Like just like probably just like, okay, if you do anything, just put it into something like VU or SCHD or a combination of this, that, or the other. So Dean says, I stand by dividend cut. I'm out. Oh, yeah, yeah. If a company cuts their dividend, then I'm out. So, yeah, Shamir. Shamir says, I'll tell all my heirs to put it on AMC. Exactly, man. Yeah, why not? Uh, Ron says, Uncle Warren said, be, be fearful when everyone is greedy. Be greedy when everyone is fearful. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, oh, for sure. People overestimate what they can do in a day but underestimate what they can do in a decade. Man, I feel that for sure. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Adon says, since you're good at math with letters, does that make you an algebra? <laughs> yeah, it sure does, I guess, man. I don't know what's up with me. You know, it's, I think it's just the pressure of the live, the live stream. I'm actually pretty good with, with numbers on the fly usually, but something about just the pressure of, of performing, I suppose. Ah, that's, that might take a weird turn. I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So what, where, where was this? This was a meme, right? This was a meme that was shared in the discord group. Be sus when others are bussing and be bussing when others are sus. You know, it's so funny. So, oh gosh, I don't think I'll be able to put that on. Let me see if I can pull it up on the discord. Cause I want to show you guys. So the picture for this meme that was shared in the Discord group, um, I kid you not, I looked at it with the haircut and Warren's face. It it seriously looked like my my little brother Holton, who's not watching, but uh, yeah, it looked. I I saw that and I was like, oh my god, that's that's him. I'm gonna see if I can pull it up. It might take me a moment, but while that's happening, we'll keep going. Um, Eli said, what about Gen X Dividend Investor? Yeah, he's definitely on there too. Gen X is on there. Dividendology's got to be on there. Uh, dividend data's got to be on there. Dividend growth investing's got to be on there. Dividend growth income, got to shout out Nick. He's on there too. I got to shout out my man Darth. Gosh, guys, there's just so many uh, so many channels. Um, Bruce Wang, The Dream Green Show, JJ Buckner, my man Professor G. Like, There's just so many people who I, I watch... Uh, who, you know, I feel like push me to be a better investor and, and make me excited about this stuff. So, um, let's see. Okay, let me, I think I can share the, I think I can share the screen to the, the two, to the Discord group. Ryan, just slow down. Okay, here it is. Okay. Okay, give me a sec. Let me see if I can share it. One sec. Oh, yeah, here we go. You ready? It's this right here. And this is the Discord group, by the way, guys. Oh, I guess while we're here, let me show you about the welcome page because so many people, 
so many people um, d like get confused about this. So when you first join the, the Discord group, you'll be sent to this page right here, welcome. It says, important, please read the following rules and click the green check icon below when done to unlock all the channels in the server. So if you read this, you can scroll down, you'll see this little green check mark right here. If you click that, all these other channels will start to will show up and you'll have access to all of them. So and this is where all this is where the party is. This is where all the action happens. So definitely uh definitely an important thing to do. So anyway. Um let's keep going. Zal, I shouted you out. I shouted you out, man. I definitely shouted you out. You were one of the first people I mentioned when I when I said uh, said everyone in the Discord group. And you know what? Speaking of the Discord group, I think we need to get Jacob Morris to make videos again, man. YouTube needs that guy. He was on a roll. He was he was crushing it. His videos are awesome. Okay, guys, and just so you know, too, it's about 545 Pacific time, my time here. So we got about 15 minutes left in the live stream tonight. Um, and do like Adon says here, don't forget to click the check mark. I did that and felt like a dum dum. <laughs> yeah, in the Discord group. And just going back, just so you guys can see here, right here, this thing. You go to the welcome page, read this stuff, click this green check mark. You'll get all the other chats and channels. So. I'd love to see you guys in the Discord group. We just hit 2,400 members in there today, which is a really cool milestone. And, um, oh, Dividend Bull too. Yeah, Dividend Bull. I forgot about him. I like him a lot too. Um, so, anyway, that's where we're at. I see you guys sharing, sh sharing some other good channels. There's just so many. This is an interesting point too. I just see this comment from Boone. It's almost not worth holding dividend stocks when bonds are giving nearly 5% a month. Yeah, it's, uh, I see, I feel like I see this said a lot. Um, a lot of people sharing this sentiment. Um, and it's just a trade off. Like, it's, there's, I don't want, I, I don't know if risk is the right word, but there's certainly more volatility with stocks. I mean, you'll get that guaranteed 5% return with the, with no movement in the principal. When you put something in a bond or a or or even a high yield savings account, but um, you also don't get the potential appreciation. You also don't get the dividend growth. Um, so they're just different. There's a guy slash gal here that is inspired by you and said that he slash she started. Investing, watching your videos at now. Oh, I missed that comment. Uh, I'd I'd love to see that. that honestly, too, guys, that's. Um, let me see if I can scroll up and find it. And honestly, too, guys, that's um, that's one of my favorite comments to hear. And I get those emails from time to time too, where someone said, "Well, we'll have said something along the lines of, you know, I just, I just started investing um, after watching your videos. You made it seem so simple, so straightforward, and and actually fun. So I started and just." Thank you, all that stuff. And that's seriously my favorite, uh, that's my favorite comment to receive. And my whole point with this, uh, oh yeah, Ari Gutman, I gotta, I cannot forget Ari. I love Ari. Such a great dude. Um, that's really my whole point. That's really my whole mission with this channel, guys. Like I've, I've said so many times, I, uh, you know, I started doing this with no experience whatsoever. Just really went into it not knowing what I was doing. And my whole mission with this is just to show that anyone can can start investing and have success with investing and and learn how to be an investor just by doing it as you go. And it doesn't take a, a genius or some sort of Wall Street guru with a finance degree from Wharton to be able to to invest for yourself and, and take build wealth, um, you know, take your wealth building into your own hands. It doesn't take these this day and age, like investing for yourself and building wealth is is more accessible than ever. And that's actually what I wrote about in this week's newsletter. You could read it in the description. Um, there's never, I, I refer to right now as like the golden age for investors or a golden age for investors because there's there's no, there's never been a more accessible time to be an investor than right now. We've got 
all these online brokerages that you can buy and sell stocks just with the you know a few clicks um, or, or or none at all. You can set it up to be completely auto, on autopilot. Like if you use something like M1 Finance, you can invest with as, as little or as much as you want. If you've got a dollar a day or a dollar a week to invest, you can do that. Um, fractional shares, you know, that kind of goes into that as well. You don't have to know anything about investing. You can just stick to the basics, stick to ETFs, stick to your VU and your SCHD and your VYM and your, you know, uh, VTI or, you know, whatever if you want to. And you don't, you can just set it and forget it. So there's, there's never been a more accessible time to be an investor. Not to mention there's, it's all commission free trading these days. So you don't have to even pay anyone to, to get started. You can just do it on your own. And the only money that you have to, to contribute, I guess, is, is, or all the money that you contribute is going to your portfolio. So, um, oh, and I, I totally forgot the diplomats, dude. Lanny and Bert, I, I, those guys are awesome. Those are some of my favorite guys to watch too. See, there's just like, ah, there's too, <laughs> there's too many great channels. There's too many great, great people in this space. Um, yeah. Mountain High said, Jeremy, yeah, well, we don't have to get into that, but I will say I, I thoroughly enjoyed having a conversation with that guy. I know a lot of people have their thoughts about him, but um, really, yeah, I really enjoyed chatting with him. He was a nice guy. I think whoever actually watched the conversation um, probably enjoyed it more than those who just clicked, saw he was in it, and left a not nice comment. So I think there was a lot of people who judged that book by its cover. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, Let's see here. Um, what else? There was a comment that I saw that I, I wanted to bring up here. <laughs> yeah, Jim says, and Shamir said too, Southern New Hampshire University. What about a guy with a finance degree from SNHU? Yeah. Duh. You know, it certainly helps. It certainly helps to have a finance degree, I will say, but it's also not required. Um, let's see. Dean says, I love your live show, Ryan. Makes us all feel involved. Well, thank you, Dean. I, I appreciate you tuning in. It's, uh, yeah, it's cool. I, um, I, man, I, I so enjoy doing these live streams. It's so much fun every single week. Um, I'd love to, I'd love, I know I talked about this before, but I'd love to do them in person. I'd love to start doing like maybe monthly, uh, at least at first, monthly dividend happy hours. I know there's a few, um, there's kind of a small group of us investors here. Uh, in the community who live in Vegas, so I think it'd be fun to to start start something up monthly, get together for like an in person happy hour, and then um, make it a thing where anyone who ever comes to Vegas, anyone who who's ever in town, um, around the same time that we have these, can can also join as well and and come hang out. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, let's see here. Uh, tell people about the free tools seeking alpha and your newsletter with dividend tracker portfolio um what what do you mean but anyway um paolo says yes you should also also you should do an online podcast with us what do you mean paolo what do you mean a, a podcast um and then big e sir big e here says one love, Ryan. Do you have stop positions um, or anything in your portfolio? No, I do not. No stop positions. No stop losses or anything like that. Um, just buy and hold, my friend. Guy says, what's going on, Guy? I hope you're having a, a good week, man. I feel like I haven't seen you for a while, but uh, I finally had a chance to sit and watch. I'm at, I'm at work in the nursing home. Oh, man. Well, thank you for tuning in at work. I hope this um, the last few minutes of the stream makes helps helps to make time go um go by faster for you at work so um oh ruger just just stopped front stepped in for mowing my lawn just wondering what your thought on these yield max etfs yeah so i talked about this last week um and i'm you know i'm ha so happy to repeat myself to it uh, whatever but um my thoughts on the yield max etfs um it's not it's not personally something that i will be investing in in my portfolio um and I would recommend that anyone who does choose to invest in the yield max ETFs, 
don't put a lot of money into them. Um, you know, how do I say this? You know, some things, I don't know. Like when I see something that's got to yield as high as something like TSLY does, I just look at that and think like there's, it's got to be too good to be true. Like if it's too, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Like there's, I don't know. There's no free lunch, I suppose. And so I just can't think of a reality where there's there's a sustainable yield that's like 40 to 70%, which I think, excuse me, is about the range that TSOY has been in since the first dividend payment this year. Their first payment was in January. But I look at something like that and I think that there's just, that that's something that cannot be sustainable over a long period of time. And so I look at something like the yield max funds. I'm going to talk specifically about TSOY because that's the most popular one. Um, I look at something like that and I think if you are going to invest any money in that, just you know try it out, buy a few shares, see what happens. But I would not put a lot of your eggs in that basket. I just think, and I know it's easy to do when you when you look at the yield and you start crunching the numbers. You look at it and say, man, I could make all of my money back in a year and a half that I invest. So. And I, I get it. Like, there's certainly, uh, it's certainly an attractive idea. But like I said, I just can't help but think that s there's some sort of catch. And um, those funds have not been around for very long, or TSOY has not been around for very long, but only since January. Um, so there's still, you still need to see how things play out, I guess. So at least like with something like Jeppy, you know, it's it's got at least at this point got a few years of of performance under its belt. Oh man, I just I hear the rain outside, guys. It's crazy. But anyway, long story short, Ruger, um, man, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, invest a ton of money into the yield max funds. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like gambling, I suppose. And I don't I don't really like making that comparison, but it's the closest one I have. Like if you're gonna go gamble, throw twenty bucks down on red, throw twenty bucks on black, you know, maybe play a few hands of blackjack, but don't like. You know, don't don't gamble with twenty dollars, lose it, then go pull two hundred dollars out of out of the ATM to to then try and win your money back. Don't don't do something like that. Remember, this is also why it helps to have some sort of investment philosophy, some sort of strategy in place that you can refer to because you might have something down like that and look at Tesla and cross reference the two and realize, you know, this really doesn't align with my strategy. It's tempting, but it doesn't align with my strategy and I need to stick to that, so. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, see like I could never I could never imagine doing that putting $50,000 into into TSOY. I'd only put $50,000 into it if I had like multiple million dollars in the bank and 50,000 was just kind of a drop in the bucket, but that's certainly I'll tell you guys what that's certainly not the case for me, so. And so, anyway. Um, let's see. Can you can you actually hear the rain, Zal? So if you can hear the rain, then you probably just heard that crazy thunder too. It's nuts, guys. It's crazy here, Dave. I hope you're. St I hope if you're still listening, Dave. I hope you're staying dry, man. Um, I saw people talking about other guys who talk about dividends. I want to give a shout out to Dapper Russ. Love his videos and also Antonio and Vess. I'm late. Yeah, man. Got a shout out, Russ. Russ is the man. Also, I know he's not on YouTube, but um. I got to shout out Harris too, who has the One Penny at a Time podcast. And also, while we're at it, I got to shout out the Dividend Talk podcast. Guys, great, great ones to listen to if you're into dividend investing. I highly recommend both of those. Um, if you're a dividend investor, you'll definitely like both of those. Also, um, the I think it's called, I know the newsletters invest with conviction. I don't know if the podcast is called the same, but it's, this is what it's called. It's, it's Mike, Mike the Dividend Guy. Um, the podcast is called the Dividend, the Dividend Blog Podcast, I think is what it's called. But it's also good as well. Um, let's see here. 
So, okay, this is, when it comes to TSOY, this is the most common thing I see. I see people say, I'm going to invest in TSOY and use the dividends to reinvest into other things. My thought is that just don't put the money in TSOY, put the money that you were going to put into that and just put it into the other things. You might as well just cut out the middleman. I don't think you should use TSOY as justification to, I don't think you should use the, the, uh, the fact that you are reinvesting the dividends elsewhere to justify putting money into TSOY in the first place, excuse me. Especially if you're new to investing. No offense, Russ, but I just don't think that's the best place to start. Uh, do what you're going to do. You know, it's your portfolio, it's your money, but that's just my take. I think there's a lot better places you can put your money as someone who's just getting started. Um... Yeah, Mauricio. So this is a really good place to, um, I'm actually going to screenshot this because this, this might be something good to talk about in like next week's live stream. Um, I really like this question. It's, it's actually one of my favorite ones to answer. And I think, uh, you know, when I'm talking to other investors too, this is one of the things that I want to know the most. It's, uh, it's the why, why did you start investing? What is, how did you get into this in the first place? And Mauricio, thank you for being a fan. I really appreciate it. So I got into investing, just I'll make it short because I would like to spend, I, I would like to, I think I could talk for like 10, 15 minutes about this. Um, and I might save that for next week's live stream. But um, so I got started investing. I got my first exposure to investing when I was probably like 11 or 12 years old, somewhere in that range, um, either like preteen or, or like early teen years. Uh, my parents made what's called a custodial account or custodian account, excuse me for all of my siblings and myself, which is essentially a brokerage account for kids who are under 18 that's managed by your, your parents. Um, and so that was my first exposure to investing. And my parents have been you know, pretty into investing. My dad's big into real estate investing and stocks and stuff like that. So um, you know, I kind of got st started. I got exposure to it early because of that. But uh, And so from that point on, when they made those custodians account, every birthday, every... Christmas, whatever, um, you know, w one thing we started getting was just money for our, Char our Charles Schwab for, for our, um, our custodian account. So from that point on, you know, every birthday or Christmas, um, once that money hit in the brokerage account, my dad would, would sit us down and in the computer and show us what he's buying and kind of why he's doing it. And it was things like Berkshire Hathaway. Um, actually, there was some SCHD. Um, Sirius XM was a big position. Uh... PG&E was a big position for a little while, and they actually, when I was holding them at one point, they had a similar thing happen to um, what happened to Hawaiian Electric just recently, and the stock just cratered. I took a big loss on that one. Just kind of like a, a really a freak thing that happened. And PG&E was our, in our area where we lived in California. That was the um, utility provider. So anyway, it was, it was tough like that. But um, that, that was my first exposure to investing, and that's how I got into it. Um, and then I didn't get, but I really didn't care. Like it wasn't something I was interested in, especially as a kid, as I'm sure you can imagine. And I didn't really um, get the bug until I was about 26 years old. And something, I'll hold back on, I'll kind of leave it there because I'd like to expand on that maybe next week and just tell the full story. Um, but something that happened when I was about 25, 26, um, not something crazy, just kind of like a shift in mindset that it was like a light bulb that went off that made me aware of, of how important this was this this stuff is to do so um anyway <laughs> yeah cl crazy man classic i want to see backstreet boys once when i was a kid let's see yeah, Zal's heard this story probably like a thousand times already. Um, <laughs> so what possessed you to buy HECO? I'm, I'm not sure what this company is, to be honest with you. Um, it's not one that I've heard of. It's not one that I have in my portfolio. Let's see. Okay, let me see if there's just there's any 
any uh oh hawaiian electric company i mean dude this was this was like years ago this was this was when it was actually like a pretty solid utility company i'm talking years ago i'm talking maybe like 20 like easily over 10 years ago so yeah it was a long time ago but they were a pretty solid utility payer paid a nice dividend um i sold that one for a pretty nice gain actually from what i remember um so, but yeah, it wasn't something that I chose personally. It was like my dad thought it was good. So that's what we went with. So anyway, guys, yeah, I think that's a. Yeah, no, I think that's a pretty solid place to uh, place to wrap it up. And I think next week, guys, maybe I'll, if you guys are cool with it, maybe I'll, I'll dive into this story a little bit more because there's some, some more like uh yeah, there's. I think there's a lot to the the whole investing origin story. In a, in addition to, like, my parents' just custodial account, because I don't know. I feel like by the time I started, um, by the time I turned like twenty five, twenty six, and started taking it seriously, it just interesting mindset shift that I'd probably like to expand on. But uh, Shaw Dog says, Ryan, did you buy PayPal after your interview last week? I did not. No, I didn't. But anyway, guys, this is a great place to wrap it up. Um, nothing else here. Yeah, really good place to wrap it up. I want to thank you guys again so much for tuning in to another Dividend Happy Hour. I'm going to keep thinking more about like our weekly cheers. I need you to think long and hard about it. Um, but I want to come up with something better than what we got here. But anyway, guys, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Don't forget to... Uh, number one, like the video if you haven't already. If you're not subscribed, yeah, maybe consider doing so. I won't uh, hold a gun to your head or anything. Um, definitely join the Discord group. There's a link to do that in the description of the video. And also definitely tune into this Sunday's video. I'm going to be coming out with my monthly portfolio update. It was kind of an interesting month in the portfolio, and I'm excited to tell you guys about it. So definitely check that out. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. I do believe... It is a long weekend this weekend, so I hope you guys enjoy the uh, the three days off that you hopefully get. But anyway, guys, thank you once again so much for all the support. Thank you for tuning into the live stream. Um, you guys are the best, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.